Welcome, everybody, and friends that are here on the Zoom call. Thank you so much for showing up. It's really so helpful for me to see faces and beings uh, interacting with these practices um, is very heartening and touching. And also welcome to anybody who may be practicing with us um, uh, with the recording after. Uh, I hope you feel a sense of connection and that you're not practicing on your own. We we extend our awareness to um, include you. My name is Jill Davey, and I'm one of the teachers with True North Insight. And tonight is part five of an introduction to a, a, a form, a system, a, a, a group, a concept, really, that the Buddha saw, had insight into, awoke to as a way to try and point people that haven't yet become fully awakened to look more closely at how we create a self, uh, how we create me and mine. And uh, I think it's a profound teaching and very liberating, very freeing. I have found it to be so anyways. So when we began um, five weeks ago, uh, starting this introduction, we started with kind of the reason why, why, why are we even talking about this? And it's because if we had to sum up the uh, boundless teachings of the Buddha, so many, so many ways in, so many, so many pointers to look more closely and clearly and understand things as they are, if they all had to be, which they don't have to be, but if they did have to be summed up into some pithy sentence, it would be that the Buddha taught suffering and the ending of suffering, or what is called dukkha and the ending of dukkha. Dukkha is a Pali word, D-U-K-K-H-A. And it's often translated in short as suffering, but it is so much more than that. And... Um, So this is how the Buddha defined suffering, this word dukkha. He said, now this, students, practitioners, is the noble truth of dukkha. Birth is dukkha. Aging is dukkha. Death is dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, Pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. Association with the unbeloved is dukkha. Separation from the loved is dukkha. And not getting what is wanted is dukkha. So, birth aging and death so some folks uh, don't like it that birth is in there they they're like birth is a joyous beautiful thing and death is we get that dukkha that's that's sad that's that's loss you know most people um don't argue with that one too much um but if we look at if you've witnessed if you've experienced birthing uh we've all been birthed and not too many come out laughing uh, it's a painful experience to be birthed uh, physically and maybe energetically and psycho psychologically also the separation and coming into the, you know a cold bright room or how, whatever birthing conditions arise you know so it just means that part of 
being born into this human form contains some suffering, some, yeah. Uh, aging, death, and uh, and then there's this little list, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. So, I mean, that list could really be expanded into a huge continuum of everything from discontent to anxiety to, you know, like this whole continuum of things just not being how we want them. Uh, so that's summed up with the phrase association with the unbeloved is dukkha, meaning being close to what you don't like, the unbeloved, what you don't want, don't like, association with that is dukkha. And conversely, separation from what is loved is dukkha. So what we do want, who we want, how we want things to be, how we want ourselves to be, et cetera, et cetera. When we're separated from that, that is also dukkha. Not getting what is wanted is dukkha. And then at the end of this definition of dukkha, it is summed up like this. He says, in short, the five clinging aggregates are dukkha. That's the punchline. The five clinging aggregates. And that's what we've been looking at in this series of looking at these five clinging aggregates. <clears throat> the word aggregate here is a translation, again, from a Pali word that's eh, not, it can be a little bit of a confusing translation. Uh, from the word kanda, and kanda is K-H-A-N-D-H-A, -H -A. and um, again, it's like a model that the Buddha taught, because this word kanda was used a lot in the, the time to, to mean like um, a heap or a pile of objects, of several things that come together into a heap. And so he was using language that people could relate to, to help describe how these different functions come together and are happening all the time, very rapidly. And we just, when we don't look closely, we could just take it to be me. That's, it's just me. <laughs> All right. Um, so there's lots more for each of the first four that we've already been introducing. Um, so just to list them in brief here, the first one is form. Mm, the form of the the elements that make up this form, physical form, but also this form and this form and these forms. All all things are made of elements and and um, create form. Um, and then the second one is something we'll call it feeling tone which is different than emotions it means that all contact of this form with the world in its immediate contact has an experience of pleasant unpleasant or neutral there's a lot more to explain about that but too much to get into tonight because we need to get to the fifth one uh, so I think I I realize that's inadequate, very. Um, but you can go back to <laughs> part two. <laughs> um, so form and then feeling tone, and the third aggregate here that or yeah, I'll just leave it at that is um, perception. 
perception is the function of labeling and identifying all the things, including myself, including you, glass, clock, pen, table, bird. Um, so it has function of memory and naming and labeling, identifying language um, that perceives. Yes, and then the fourth one um, is mental formations, is one way to say it. Um, these are where we get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> this is where uh, then there's a lot of stories that come, a lot of uh, mental formations. Um, references to past and future, um, emotions, cognitive thinking. Um, yeah, stories, all the stories that come. The last of these five aggregates is called Vijnana in Pali, which means consciousness. Vijnana is spelled V-I-N-N-A-N-A -N -N -A in Pali. And uh, consciousness is the knowing of, that which knows. And when it's one of these clinging aggregates, it's taken as I am the knowing, I am the knower. It is me that is knowing. This is when it's not seen clearly. And uh, <clears throat> this faculty of consciousness, there's actually six six streams of consciousness. There's eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, mouth consciousness, touch consciousness, and mind consciousness. So that when the eye opens, the form of the eye opens and it receives the form of light and shape and shadow of these forms around. <clears throat> There's a, the feeling tone happens, the perception of these objects being there, which creates me being here and the stories about them. But right in that moment of knowing, the, the awareness, there's a I consciousness that happens right in that, in that moment. The I is receiving I consciousness. And then for each of the sense doors, this can also be discerned as just that bare contact of ear consciousness. There's an awareness of the ear receiving object, form, and the other factors that come along. These aggregate, it, 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 it can be a problematic translation because it sounds like they're things, like they're, they're a little bit like, like a little pile of rocks, you know, that they're separate things, but really they're a little more accurately um, described as um, what's the word I had? Lost it in my notes. Um, I had a better word for it. One second. Hmm. 
Hmm. I might have moved it. Yeah, they're they're more better described as functions, as systems. Um, not so much as objects, but as activities or functions. Each of these five aggregates function in a way. So to think of them as um, activities or functions. So for instance, well, I, won't, I probably shouldn't. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that just because of time. We could go a long ways down this rabbit hole, but I want to move on. Um, so it's really this, this vinyana or consciousness is just the, the bare knowingness, the bare awareness of through each of the sense doors. If there's a thought arising, there's mind consciousness. Um, in other contexts, in other suttas, consciousness can have different meanings. But here, in the five aggregates, it just means bare, just that bare, the simple cognizing, knowing, um, through each of these six senses. Yeah. In each of these, um, let me just, somebody's just coming in, so I just want to mute everybody so that that doesn't pop up. Okay. Um, okay. In each of these aggregates or khandhas, um, the, the Buddha also offered a beautiful a helpful image called a simile that helps is a different way in. I find them really helpful, evocative images that can help us understand or um, get a sense of what, what he's pointing to. Uh, so for this one, I'll, I'll maybe just read, it's just a short paragraph of, of the simile for consciousness. Uh, so it's written, now suppose that a magician or a magician's apprentice, some translations says, say a conjurer, magician, same thing, were to display a magic trick at a major intersection. So um, the intersections at, at that time were places where vendors would often be to sell their wares and stuff because that's where you're going to get the most amount of people at an intersection. So this is why it's being referred to in this way. So a magician or a magician's apprentice were to display a magic trick at a major intersection and a person with good eyesight were to see it, observe it, and appropriately examine it. To them, seeing it, observing it, and appropriately examining it, it would appear empty, void, without substance. For what substance could there be in a magic trick? I appreciate this uh, analogy because so many times I've watched like a magic show or, you know, and, and you know, it's a trick. They're not really making the person disappear. They're not really cutting them in half. You know, they're not really, you know, just pulling a rabbit out of thin air. We know it's a trick, but we're still like, wow. We're still awed by it and, and mm, captivated by it. And so it goes on in the same way, a student, a practitioner sees, observes and appropriately examines any consciousness that is past, future, or present, internal or external, latent or subtle, common or sublime, far or near. And to them, to us, seeing it, observing it, and appropriately examining it, it would appear empty, void, without substance. For what substance could there be in consciousness? 
So when this becomes a clinging aggregate, which is part of the definition of dukkha, um, is when we think that's who I am. I am the knower. I am consciousness. When we see that consciousness is changing all the time, depending on what what this sense with this form is meeting with it's co consciousness is constantly changing there's hearing consciousness touch consciousness mind consciousness it's like this now it's like that now um and so we can see that it's like a conjurer's trick a magic trick but it seems so true it seems like that's who i am um, Tanisaro Bhikkhu writes this about, so, mm -hmm. I'm going to go here first, <laughs> inner dialogue happening. Uh, there's a, a sutta, the Samyutta Nikaya 2248, for those who like to reference these things, uh, where the Buddha describes what he's giving a teaching to some monks of what is the what are the five aggregates and what are the five clinging aggregates. So it's not that the five aggregates are bad or wrong or something you need to control or get rid of. It's just how this amazing thing experiences the world. It's fantastic. The dukkha is in the clinging. This we know, but this we need to be reminded of. It's the clinging aggregates, the five clinging aggregates. So when we cling to them as that, as if there's something permanent, solid, continuous, separate from everything and everyone else, um, that's me and mine, there's the dukkha. Um, so yeah, there's there's a whole teaching there on, we could just start with the form one, where he says, whatever form, past, present, or future, internal or external, latent or subtle, common or sublime, far or near, that is the aggregate of form. Now, here's the difference. That's just the aggregate of form. No problem. We can just know, oh, form. But when it becomes a clinging aggregate, listen to the difference. There's similarities, whatever form, past, present, or future, internal, external, latent or subtle, common or sublime, far or near, that is clingable, offers sustenance, so good, and is accompanied with mental fermentation. <laughs> Does anybody ever made uh, fermented vegetables. Um, that is called form as a clinging aggregate. So you, you hear there what's different is that it's become clingable. We've clung to it. It offers sub sustenance. What's it sustaining? Feeding, nourishing sense of self as being separate, continuous, permanent, etc. Um, so when we're using it as a sustenance to say, you know, I am this form, this is my hair, and I need to keep it strawberry blonde, because that's who I am. You know, not that I ever was strawberry blonde, but, um, you know, whatever aspect we want to get sustenance from. And is accompanied with mental fermentation. These are called the asavas, the taints, that that you know, then it just creates all this mental fermentation and bubbling and growing and proliferating. So the aggregates are not the problem, it's the not seeing clearly and clinging to that is uh, where we create suffering. Says a lot. I'm going too fast. <laughs> I get excited. All right. Um, 
<sighs> so Tanasaro Bhikkhu says this about how to not cling. He says, the Buddhist approach to ending this clinging, however, is not simply to drop it. Thank you for that, because impossible. <laughs> oh, when people say, well, just drop it. It's like, what? What does that mean? Just drop it. When when we're, you know, how does one just drop something? It it doesn't work like that. So he says, as with any addiction, again, brilliant. To see it as an addiction, yes. As with any addiction, the mind has to be gradually weaned away. <laughs> Before we can reach the point of, he, he gets into intentions here, because with the clinging aggregates, there's intention. There's an intention to create and hold on to. Um, he says, we have to change our intentions toward these khandas or aggregates. We need to change our intention, not to just say drop it or which doesn't work, but to change our intention um, so as to change their functions. I love this part. He says, instead of using them for the purpose of constructing a self, he talks about them like bricks because there's a weight to them, a heaviness when they're clung to. So instead of using them to construct a self, we use them for the purpose of creating a path to the end of suffering. So beautiful. Instead of carrying piles of bricks on our shoulders, we take them off and lay them along the ground as pavement. That paragraph is so good. The Buddhist approach to ending this clinging is not simply to drop it as with any addiction, the mind has to be gradually weaned away. And we do this by changing our intention to change their function. So instead of using them to build up myself and solidify and separate myself. We use them to create the path, the noble eightfold path, the path to the ending of suffering. Yes. Last, last little nugget here of the many nuggets. <laughs> This is another little evocative image. This is from Samyutta Nikaya 22.100. And he compares the clinging aggregates, these functions when they're not seen clearly and they're clung to um, as a dog tied to a leash by a leash to a post or a stake in the ground. And if it walks, it walks right around that post or that stake. If it stands, it stands right next to the post or stake. If it sits, it sits right next to the post. If it lies down, it lies down right next to the post. And in the same way, someone that is not seeing clearly with insight, with wisdom, with curiosity, uh, regards this form or these feelings, these perceptions, these mental fabrications, this consciousness as this is mine, this is myself, this is what I am. When we stand, we stand right next to these five clinging aggregates. If we sit, we sit right next to them. If we lay down, we lay down right next to them. It's a very evocative image. So where, where do we, you, me, us, 
each of us, where do we mo cling the most? Some we some of us, maybe the whole package, <laughs> all of them, but maybe there's one place where we tend to maybe you know as we age we might start to see this form is not really who i am because like hello <laughs> which form my five-year-old form my 15 year old form oh so long gone my 50 year old form also gone you know there may be but many feel that is who they are is this form especially especially maybe i shouldn't maybe i shouldn't say especially if there's a lot of identity given to us with our form like you know you're so beautiful then you better work hard to maintain that beauty because that's who you are right and so there can be a lot of clinging there or um vedna we might not get so stuck there or feeling tone pardon me of um this pleasant unpleasant and neutral bare contact with the world um how would one take that up to be so it's me experiencing the pleasantness i mean already there's clinging there but so in the perception, certainly that can be like, I am the one that's seeing, I am the one that's feeling, I am the one that's hearing, that's wanting, that's getting, you know, then we're already into the mental formations of like, I am the one that's, you know, we we look at our thread of memories, subjective memories, um, very subjective. and. Um, we say that's who I am. There's mental fabrications there and perceptions there. Or we say, I am the one that's going to be. We can push off into the future. I'm the one that's going to be fill in all the infinite blanks. And then with consciousness, I am the one that's knowing. So where, where 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 is it stickiest for you? It can be helpful to look more closely and see what you know what where where do I feel me is, and uh, not to create a problem with that, but to direct our intention towards seeing clearly what these what these functions are. And how they happen so instantly and so quickly that we don't even usually look at them. But in that rapidity, rapidness, um, they just tumble together and we're like, that's who I am. All these experiences that are happening. Mm, that was a lot. Sorry. <laughs> don't usually go on quite that long on these Wednesday night talks but um tonight was part five so it went a bit much all of this doesn't matter <laughs> work so hard to try and make some coherence and it's like yeah it doesn't matter what matters is our direct experience so there's three ways of knowing, hearing, listening to the Dhamma is important. Um, but, and then we want to then reflect more, consider it, keep studying, have conversations, listen to other Dharma talks, keep reflecting. That's the second way of developing wisdom. And the third is direct knowing, direct experience. And so let's do that. <laughs> practice let's do that now and check it out for yourself don't take uh, my word or the buddha's word or anything for it this is why we practice to know for ourselves okay so um set aside distractions if you want to join us for practice now adjust your posture 
Uh, dim your lights, lay down if you're experiencing pain or fatigue, stand up if you're very sleepy. Mm. So I like taking my knees and feet a bit wider here because I'm in a chair just to feel that sense of stability and letting the legs relax or fall into a comfortable posture. I'm also sitting my upper back away from the back of the chair so that I'm not too comfortable or sleepy. Not that I'm trying to be uncomfortable, blatantly not, but uh, just upright is what I'm looking for in my posture. Mm. Then let all that stream of wordiness flow through, flow by, float on. Let it just be of its nature arising and passing. Let the eyes settle either closed or downward or resting on something with a soft gaze. See if you need any movement or stretching before you come into stillness or looking around your space. Any sighing breaths. And then just feel into the muscles of the face and see if there's any tension held here that isn't needed right now. Perhaps across the forehead, through all the muscles of the eyes, the jaw, the tongue, calming our expression to help bring calm to the mind. As the face invites peace, the shoulders slide down as the neck muscles lengthen, and the shoulder bones experience gravity. All the way down into relaxed hands. Checking in with the area of the heart center and belly center. And seeing if it's helpful or possible to have some degree of softening to these inner layers. When the nervous system is engaged or activated, uh, these inner layers of the belly can be contracted or tight. So softening the belly can help calm. If there's a lot of sleepiness, you can practice with eyes open or standing or just awareness. Sleepiness is here and it's like this.
And then feeling the contact of this form with sensations of ground. Contact, pressure, temperature, texture. And this first aggregate of form is just being known as it is. All these sensations arising and passing. Flowing, tingling. what the Buddha described as a glob of foam floating down a river. These elements of earth, water, fire or temperature, and air. Constant flux and change and flow. Let's take a few minutes together in silence, attending to this first aggregate of form. This form with its sense doors, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, touch, mind, making contact with all the other forms of this existence. And just seen in their nature of arising and passing, conditioned unreliable, not to be clung to as me and mine. At times, we might be able to turn awareness towards the next aggregate of feeling tone or Vedana. 
Perhaps a sudden sound happens in your environment and at times, usually in hindsight, we might notice it as an unpleasant contact or pleasant or neither. There may be a sensation somewhere building, um, beginning to stand out in the body. And before it becomes a strong aversion or desire, it might just be known as pleasant or unpleasant or neither. When it's neither, we usually don't notice it. Perhaps an itch or a tingle will arise, as it usually does when I say the word itch and see if you can just notice the feeling tone of it is instantly for most unpleasant maybe it's different for you before it becomes a version and there's an immediate reaction to getting rid of it see if you can just feel it it's form it's Vedna, feeling tone, and it's changing. Eventually it passes away. The Buddha described these experiences of feeling tone like a when it's raining heavy rain and on the water it uh, makes a water bubble that easily pops it's just a, a bubble that arises and pops and the vedana is like this And sometimes we can just name that feeling tone and it stops it from becoming desire or aversion. It's just no, no, pleasant, Vedana, or unpleasant. Sometimes we might get a glimpse of the third aggregate of perception. Perhaps a sound arises and instantly the mind, this function of perception, names it, places it, categorizes, remembers. All of this happens instantly. And when this is not seen with wisdom, when the form or contact combined with feeling tone places, names, 
something pleasant is there and I want it. Or something unpleasant is over there and I don't want it. This is not seeing perception clearly. The Buddha described this as a mirage. And sometimes we may notice and experience that we get caught into mental formations, sankaras, where the stories begin. A thought arises and we're, we're off into the future or the past. There may be emotions. Stories, opinions. And the central character in all of those stories is me. The Buddha described these mental formations like the trunk of a banana tree that doesn't have any hardwood in it. It's just made of layers, layers, and layers of banana leaves. Layers and layers of story. And lastly, vijnana consciousness. When clung to becomes I am, 
the knowing. When seen clearly is that knowing, cognizing is happening, is co-arising. is arising and passing, is conditioned, changing. The Buddha described this as a magician's magic trick. All of this can be known free of clinging, free of dukkha. We take these bricks off of our shoulders instead of using them to construct a self. We lay them along the ground as part of the path. Seeing thus the well-instructed student of the noble ones grows disenchanted with form, disenchanted with feeling tone, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with mental fabrication, disenchanted with consciousness, Disenchanted one grows free from passion, dispassionate. Through dispassion, one is released. With release, there's the knowledge. Released. Released.
Hmm. There was something that arose at one point that I was like, oh, I should say that at the end, but now it's gone. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. No, it will come to me in the wee hours of the morning. <laughs> Again, so if you're um, new to this uh, topic, uh, please don't add any mental formations around it being complex or confusing or not getting it. It's just an introduction to plant seeds, to listen to more talks, find a teacher, uh, do some reading or let it go entirely it's just a model that can be very liberating um, and you don't have to get it getting sounds like clinging <laughs> all right thank you for joining us um, for practice and um, we'll see what comes next time